right, I'd like to officially welcome all of you to the California Initiative to Advance Precision Medicine Symposium on Cancer Disparities Research. I'm Julianne McCall. I'm very proud to be the director of the initiative and serve as the director of precision medicine within the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research. I'm joined uh, by my extraordinary staff, um, including uh, Dr. David Reiner, who will be emceeing the remainder of this uh, symposium. Uh, before I pass off the microphone, um, I just wanna thank uh, the teams for the tremendous dedication um, that you've all shown. Uh, I remember May 1st, 2019, we gathered in the governor's office um, conference room to launch these projects and the, 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 the energy of the conversation and just the extraordinary hope shared across teams um, just gave me you know, enormous inspiration. Um, and I'm very proud uh, that we've made it to this stage, very proud as a state to have supported um, such world-class researchers and community partners uh, trying to help change and update the, the paradigm of community-driven uh, and patient-focused uh, research in cancer. So uh, with those very brief remarks, I'm going to pass it off now to uh, Dr. David Reiner, Science Officer in the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, thank you, Dr. McCall, for that introduction. Uh, my name is David Reiner. I'm a science officer, which means I oversee our demonstration research projects, including our three projects on cancer. And we're delighted to uh, welcome you to this uh, symposium on those projects. Uh, we have three presentations today, uh, one on each of those uh, three cancer projects. And I'll just uh, get right into it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, one, one more thing. Uh, after the presentations, we'll have a discussion uh, followed by kind of a, a closing, a closeout uh, of different closing remarks. Uh, so moving on uh, to the next uh, talk, this is uh, from the University of California, San Diego, Dr. Drs. William Kim and Pablo Tamoyo. Uh, and just to introduce uh, them, Dr. William Kim is assistant professor in the Department of Genomics and Precision Medicine at UCSD School of Medicine, and his research focuses on understanding molecular mechanisms of tumor-promoting genes to guide improved therapeutic strategies. He received his PhD from Duke University in molecular genetics and completed postdoctoral fellowships at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard in medical oncology and cancer. Dr. Pablo Tamayo is a professor in the Department of Genomics and Precision Medicine at UCSD School of Medicine, and his research focuses on cancer pathways and targets, treatment outcomes, disease subtypes, and drug responses. He received his PhD in physics from Boston University and completed postdoctoral fellowships at Boston University, Thinking Machines Corporation, and Los Alamos National Laboratory in physics and computational science. They are joined today uh, by members of their team, including Dr. Rebecca Shatsky, Dr. Barbara Parker, and Dr. Connie McDaniels. Uh, and with that, uh, take it away, William and Pablo. Okay, thank you. Could you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is um, this picture is the way we envision this project uh, at the beginning. Uh, now that we are completing it, we did I think most of what we proposed and a little bit more. So I'll try to very quickly give you an overview. So we are a large team, and what what I'm presenting is the result of the work of many, many people working together. Uh, our system is called Celsius, and it's based on an early propo proponent of precision medicine 2,000 years ago in the times of the Roman Empire, Aulus Celsius, who advocated uh, that medicine should be rational. Uh, we use a paradigm based on, it's a Bayesian information theoretic paradigm uh, introduced by Alan Turing and uh, I.J. Good in times of when they were cracking the Enigma machine during the war. Uh, it's not a black box, it's sort of AI-like, but this is sort of a more transparent approach to that. And it's uh, rational, hopefully it's uh, Pinker approved. Uh, 
And uh, hopefully it uh, allows to look at cancer in a, in a different way. So the first aim was to make this model to characterize pathways, in particular the one relevant to triple negative breast cancer. And this is the way the system looks like today. Uh, it has everything that we proposed originally, and it has a few extra features that I will describe. Um, it allows to match uh, treatments with tumor samples using genomic features that could include mutations, pathways, protein profiles, etc. So it's a, beginning, it's a very general system. It can work on any cancer. It can be specialized for triple negative or even subsets. So it has great flexibility. <clears throat> One part of the system is the model building, which is shown on the left. It's basically training the model with existing response data. And this could be from drug screens, CRISPR screens, could be data from patients that were treated in the past, could be organoids, could be TDXs, could be any type of response data that can be used to train the model. And then on the right side, when you have a new sample, the model will try to classify it and tell you what is the likelihood of response to a collection of uh, uh, pharmaceutical interventions or therapies. And it will give you a nomogram showing why the model thinks that the, there will be response to each of the drugs. And it will also tell you which drugs are more likely and also which drugs are likely to be counterproductive. So it, it shows you both sides. Uh, the model is built on um, a model of tumor states that we developed as part of another project sponsored by uh, the National Cancer Institute. And then we basically map our cohort and we projected. So here you can see in this map of tumor states, our breast cancer samples tend to go into certain states more than others. So we, we, this is a very useful way to understand what is happening. So I'm going to give you a very brief example of how the model predicts response to a, a drug, uh, dabrafenib, which is used to treat, uh, for example, BRAF mutant cancers like melanomas and others. So the model finds genomic features that correlate with the response. This data here is cell lines that uh, either respond or not to the drug. And here it finds these genomic coordinates and states that are relevant to the prediction. Following that weight of evidence, it creates probability, conditional probability models to describe that, and then combines them on a nomogram where you can see graphically the amount of evidence that each feature contributes either in favor of response or, or no response. Uh, once that you do this for hundreds of drugs, according to whatever is the input data, you can sort them and see what are the drugs that have the highest likelihood to affect the tumor. And in this case, I'm showing you a melanoma cell line, and these are the model predictions, and every cross at the end of this bar is a case where the cell line is actually sensitive to the drug. This is a cell line that was not used to train the model. This is like a new cell line. And as you can see, some that could be very good, Sometimes some drugs are very predictable, some are not. So the model not always works. Sometimes works very well. Um, here is another, uh, another prediction, different cell line. In this case, it's a breast cancer cell line. The drug in this case is the cetabine. And again, the model sort of gets that right. Uh, now, uh, we'll tell you a little bit more of the model in A3. Now we are going to, so this is what the model is, right, in a nutshell. Now we'll tell you a little bit about another aspect of the model that is more experimentally exploring uh, sensitivities. And here, uh, William Kim is going to describe the same. Uh, William? Yeah, so can you see the mouse? Can, can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see the mouse. Okay. Well, I'll just describe them. So yes, uh, as Paolo was mentioning, we've one of the very effective ways to kind of close the loop in, in this kind of approach, this powerful algorithm is to then actually 
test some of these predictions. And, uh, you know, we started out conscious with the understanding that triple negative breast cancer, not only clinically is a highly aggressive disease, but one that's highly heterogeneous. So, you know, we knew going in that there was going to be a lot of complexities. Uh, we managed uh, through this project a test highly um, predicted uh, individual agents, 48 individual agents that many of which are actually clinically deployed. And we also perform drug combinations, which all sort of uh, count, accounted for roughly 1400 or more assays. And we've also deployed some of the models that I, I describe in, in the next slide. But one thing that uh, is quite clear, we knew sort of had expected it going in, but coming out of it, we realized that some of the agents as a single agent was not as effective as was claimed in the literature. And that is largely because it's sort of a glass, uh, you know, empty versus a little bit full, you know, and, and a lot of these ca cancers are highly resilient to even the most effective agents, some of which have been preclinically tested. So we really kind of switched gears quickly to think about some of the combinations. And so uh, in the next slide. Yeah, so so we, we really kind of uh, wanted to look at combinations that are highly effective, not leaving any cell lines, uh, cell cancer cells behind and have found some non-trivial combinations, some of which are highlighted here. So, so the ones that are in, in the dark blue really represents this highly effective killing and, and each of the columns and rows represent individual drugs. And we see evidence of synergy. Now, synergy has been uh, much rarer than by chance. And this is a, a result that's been confirmed by others, but certainly this approach allowed us to hone in at least on, on some of the agents that would be highly synergistic and potentially effective. Um, we also tested this across uh, patient-derived organoids. These organoids were uh, collected through this project in close collaborations with biorepository at the Morse Cancer Center here, as well as Drs. Parker and Dr. Shatsky. And we've collected a number of um, uh, tumors that then we were successfully able to establish eight patient-derived organoids, these uh, triple negative Breast cancer organoids are uh, known to be quite challenging to establish. So we're excited not only for the fact that we have those eight uh, organoids, but then three of those are uh, Hispanics. And to my understanding that those uh, from Hispanic patients are extremely rare. So we have um, generated some of those and um, we prof profile some of these that were then um, assessed through the models, some of the models that Pablo was uh, describing. And we were also able to test some of the drug combinations and and some more effective than others, although uh, in retrospect, some of these uh, or, or sort of concurrent clinical trials have confirmed that some of these agents are highly toxic in patients. So that's sort of a, a double-edged sword in, in some of these drug combinations. So the next slide, please. Uh, the AIM-3 of this uh, really uh, embarked on trying to establish collaborations and, and really start to deploy some of the, the samples from, from both UCSD as well as the clinic, uh, some of the community collaborators. Uh, we, uh, through Dr. Cl collaborations with Dr. Shatsky and Parker, Dr. Parker, collected 53 uh, unique samples that were uh, profiled and 14 of these were Hispanics. And we also uh, worked in very close collaboration. Some of, some of the details I'll provide in the next slide of um, working alongside El Centro uh, Regional Medical Center at Collaboration. And this is a 84% uh, a, a, a Hispanic uh, community serving hospital. And, and, and some of the individuals that really spearheaded this effort are highlighted here. Dr. Parker and, and Dr. Alfredo Mononillo uh, directed the uh, biorepository and Dr. Ahmed who's the, the, the physician at, at this community hospital. And you know, one of the things that you, you know, unless you really get into this project, you don't quite anticipate until you, you know, day one, you're you're starting, you know, you're you're really trying to establish some of these. And some of the challenges I've highlighted here, uh, there's uh, in the, the later part of the slides. Uh certainly was things that we didn't anticipate were how how uh, there were really lack of infrastructure for research and collaboration. And it's something that we really have to build from ground up, uh, thanks to work of Dr. Parker sort of the persistent effort. And, and certainly COVID has, has, has really been a big hurdle. 
And some of the com community hospital physicians have an enormous amount of bandwidth issues. It, it's, um, you know, it's not to say the academic physicians have less bandwidth issues, but they certainly had some challenges. So I'll highlight some of these in the, in the later part of the slides. Uh, yeah, so based on having these samples that, that William described, we can now study, for example, what are the difference between uh, Latina, non-Latina tumors? And here you see a little bit of that on the left. And we can already see a little bit differences in what tumor states tend to be enriching in one particular ethnicity versus another. So these are not all the samples. We, we still need to add a few. And this will be something we'll report uh, in more detail. Uh, we can look at metastatic, another property, basically any phenotypes. Also, we can apply the model to predict responses to these samples from our cohort. So these are not cell lines, these are the actual uh, patient samples. And as you can see, uh, some samples have certain possibilities. There are multiple drugs that are predicted to be potentially useful. And other samples, like the one on the right, seems to be resilient to everything. These are very robust and difficult cancers to treat. And I think what this is telling us is that probably our uh, arsenal of drugs is not complete yet. Um, and another thing that was very interested uh, is we can study the changes in tumors before and after treatment. And here you can see a transition from one state to another induced by treatment. And these are very interesting. We didn't sort of propose this at the beginning of the project, but I think this is something that we would like to follow up. Uh, now, aim four, uh, William, you want to? Yeah. So, in, in the interest of time, I, I, I'm, you know, I think we're running behind. Uh, aim four really uh, highlights some of the activities of trying to engage the the community and the stakeholders. This is our um, pre-COVID CIMPM kickoff meeting with a lot of. Um, patient advocates and, and um, some of our community collaborators on uh, the next slide. And some of the reports, uh, this is spearheaded by Dr. Corinne uh, McDaniel, who's uh, with us here today, uh, who put together this report in this very beautiful uh, graphics and uh, has some very compelling uh, voices being described or heard through this report that, that again, we'll, we'll uh, disseminate through the, or, or we'll, we'll um, share through the uh, report. And um, I, I wanna highlight, uh, next slide please, some of the challenges certainly, um, uh, I'm sure everybody really sort of went through this. this. This COVID really had struck us in a number of different ways. The physical lockdown certainly had effects in, in, in how we navigate the, the physical aspects of the project, but a lot of um, resignations and a lot of turnovers with the team members as well as the admin staff both uh, here at our uh, institute as well as the the, commu the collaborating community institute. So uh, it really sort of highlights the fact that uh, we really kind of, uh, through resilience, persistence, and goal-driven uh, approach, uh, we're able to get to where we are. And so in, in really sort of the closing, and, and, and apologize for the short letters, but we've put to, we've uh, through this project have uh, put together this really uh, powerful machine learning algorithm that Pablo has uh, mentioned that could be uh, the basis for a lot of um, guidance towards precision medicine uh, approaches. We've learned tremendous amount of uh, complexities underlying tri triple negative, some of which are, we didn't have time to highlight, but. Uh, we also managed to work with the community from ground up, establishing this collaboration. In fact, uh, this apparently was one of the first and only academic centers in San Diego to establish a remote consenting and uh, uh, through telemedicine in part due to uh, COVID pandemic. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll share some of these and, and more in, in our uh, progress report. So it certainly takes a village, uh, you know, here are the individuals that all were, you know, excited to uh, join and, and and be part of this team. And, and we're really grateful for, obviously, for um, the generous support of the Precision Medi uh, Medicine uh, California Initiative and the program officers and, and, and um, some of the community physicians, as well as uh, patient. And so Pablo uh, has a, has a um, uh, next slide. You, you want to describe the next? Yeah, so uh, um, 
sadly, we we have to report that our patient advocate, advocate uh, passed away recently, a few days ago. Uh, Bryce Olson was, um, you know, somebody that was an inspiration to us. He uh, worked hard against cancer as a patient, and he also was tireless trying to raise awareness of uh, the importance of precision medicine. And one thing I would like to say is that, you know, we face all this challenge, all of us, all the complexity of the disease, the problems with healthcare, and so sometimes it's frustrating, right, day by day, but I want you to remember that there are millions of patients that are really rooting for us. Maybe they, we don't know them personally, maybe they don't know them, we don't know us one by one, but they are there and they are counting on us. So I think we should keep working and uh, know that this is a very main, meaningful enterprise despite the, the challenges and all that. So that's it. Um, I think we're done. Thank you, uh, Pablo and William, and thank you for that reminder at the end uh, about the the people, the patients, the families um, uh, that you and we are doing this all for. Um, it's not an easy transition for me to ask for questions, um, but we have time for one question if anyone has one. Wait, just a quick question. So what what type of tissue and information do you need to put as input into this model? So right now we use uh, uh, DNA and RNA sequencing. Uh, we can add other things like protein assays, other types of clinical information. So all that can easily be layered into the model. Um, and that's in terms of the genomics. In terms of the response, anything that uh, provides information about the potential response in the past or in assays or anything, the model will try to correlate that with the genomics and give us a model where given a new genomic profile, it will find the likelihood of response to whatever agents were used uh, as input. So it's very flexible. Uh, as we go deeper into, for example, triple negative, uh, I think certain pathways will be more important and relevant. So the models could be tailored all the way down to a very specific population, or the models could be very general, for example, just predict metastasis in general. Uh, so this flexibility is very useful. The the challenge is obviously that each of these models require a lot of effort to put in place. But so, the model is very flexible in principle and powerful from that point of view. So a lot will talk next, but we have actually a lot of yeah, uh, DNA and RNA seq yeah. data that potentially we could put into your model. Yeah. Just thinking the same thing, yes. Yes. And do you have any res any response data? Um, Actively being collected. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. In in progress. Yeah. So let let's talk at some point, and yes, we'll be happy to to look at that, and that that will be an interesting application. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, William and Pablo, and those the exact type of conversations that we hope to uh, to foster, uh, you know, today and and beyond. Um. So I just wanted to uh, thank all our speakers. Um. Dr. Patel, who uh, who was able to just join us, um, Drs. Kim and Tamayo, and Dr. Ziv, as well as every member of their project team uh, and uh, community partners, as well as all the participants and patients and families that um, were engaged in, in the research. Um, I also wanted to take a minute to acknowledge uh, CIPM's uh, former program officer uh, and co-director, Dr. Shannon Muir, uh, for her talented oversight of the cancer disparities portfolio uh, for almost the whole duration, except for the last few months.
Uh, I'd like to thank our advisors, uh, Surgeon General Dr. Ramos, uh, Ms. Duran, as well as our advisory council uh, chair, Dr. Lajan Sher, for joining the symposium. Uh, and we'll hear remarks from them towards the end of our discussion session today. So that concludes the uh, recorded presentation session for today. Uh, so I'll stop the recording and then pass the mic to Julianne to open the discussion session. Thank you so much, David. And to echo um, the expression of gratitude, like I mentioned in my opening remarks, it's been just a true privilege to allocate state funds uniquely to cancer disparities research projects with a precision medicine lens. Uh, the entire goal of our initiative is to demonstrate the promise and potential of precision medicine. And we really look forward to presenting an evaluation report to the legislature um, through a process that I'll mention toward the end of our uh, symposium here in the final 40 minutes. Um, but before we conclude, 